Aviators, engineers, and dreamers are always trying to push the envelope. But sometimes the envelope pushes back. In the history of aviation, there were ideas that didn't quite work the way they were supposed to. The Hiller flying platform is a pretty goofy idea for a flying machine. There were ideas that were just a little ahead of their time. Uh, I, I flew it every chance I got. <laughs> I was sorry they canceled it, I would have been flying it yet. And there were ideas that just wouldn't fly. The way they came up with this idea is either they were drunk or somebody had seen a science fiction movie. From the underappreciated to the downright bizarre to the plainly disastrous, these aircraft are a different breed of UFO. We've selected our top 10, and we're counting them down. These are all unbelievable flying objects. The second half of the 20th century was a bold era in aviation. It was the dawn of the space age, the infancy of the jet age a time when test pilots joined ball players as national heroes. The Cold War had changed the calculus of aviation, and suddenly, anything seemed possible, or at least worth trying. The mentality was, let's make it and try it and see what happens. Some of it worked, some of it didn't. Some of these airplanes went faster than you could imagine, and some of them flew straight into the ground. But there's an old saying, just because something can be done doesn't always mean it should be. These are the stories of 10 aircraft from the annals of aeronautics that might be better called aeronautics. We were willing to make mistakes. We were willing to try things that we might not have tried in a different period of time. We almost had to crash to, uh, to learn. With the full benefit of 2020 hindsight, we count down these ill-fated, unbelievable flying objects from number 10 to number one. In the 1940s and 50s, everyone dreamed of having their own personal flying machine. And why not? You'd keep it in the garage or the backyard, hop in, start the engine, and off you'd go. In the early 50s, a government engineer named Charles Zimmerman had an idea. What if the rotors of a helicopter were put on the bottom of an aircraft? Then the pilot could steer the flying platform simply by shifting his weight from side to side. All sorts of models came out with names like Helovector, Aerocycle, Propcopter. There was only one tiny problem nobody seemed to notice. One wrong move and the pilot could fall through the rotors and end up as human gazpacho. These things were like flying vegematics, but one of them caught the U.S. Army's eye. This is the Hiller Flying Platform. This is probably the closest that anybody has come to developing a true magic carpet ride. The thinking went, you could put a soldier on the Hiller and he could zip across the battlefield. All you had to do was pull the cord and start her up, just like a lawnmower. Flying platforms offered the potential for freeing the infantrymen from the restrictions of the terrain. The flying platform consists of a large duct. Contained within the duct are the engines that power the main rotors that lift it. The Hiller used a ducted fan to give the vehicle lift, including two counter-rotating propellers. The duct eliminates the turbulence that would normally form at the tips of the rotor blades, making the propeller more efficient. To control the aircraft, the pilot would simply lean in the direction that he wished to travel. Lean right, go right, lean forward, go forward. Very simple in concept, but a little bit more difficult in execution. Just looks like it'd be a riot to, to be in this thing, and you could almost charge people to do this at a carnival. Just a great idea. A simple throttle governing engine speed and a yaw control, and presto, you've got a one-man airborne fighting machine. 
It's more like a flying lawnmower. You could cut a lot of grass with a Hiller flying platform. At least a lawnmower is stable. The Hiller was a challenge to stabilize and control, especially for a GI playing amateur pilot. As you would gain speed, the leading edge of the platform would generate more lift than the trailing edge. As a result, the front of the platform would begin to pitch up, so you can never exceed maybe 15 miles per hour or so. The flying platform was also unstable above 10 feet. Hey, at least the soldier could fly 10 feet high. And the idea that a soldier could fly that thing and then fire a weapon is crazy. As you see from the uh, pilot leaning forward, when you lean forward or raise your gun and change the center of gravity of the platform, it's gonna start moving on you. Totally unstable, too slow, impossible to shoot from, and better suited for cutting grass. For some reason, the Army canceled the program in 1959. In our countdown of unbelievable flying objects, the Hiller Flying Platform is number 10. The Cold War spawned some pretty impressive aircraft, but some of them were less Dr. Strange love than just plain strange. The Pogo and the Salmon, yes, that's what they were called, have to be among the strangest. In the early 50s, the Navy was looking for a vertical takeoff and landing, or VTOL, fighter aircraft that could operate off of almost any Navy ship. That way, if the dreaded Soviet nuclear attack ever came, the Navy's fighter aircraft would be spread out instead of being sitting ducks. So the result of this was a competition between two aircraft for a vertical takeoff and landing fighter plane. The Navy awarded contracts to two competing manufacturers, Convair and Lockheed, to develop prototypes. Convair came up with the XFY-1, also known as the POGO. Lockheed designed the XFV-1, nicknamed the Salmon. Both these planes were designed to sit on their tails, so they would be ready for vertical takeoff. It would have been great if that had been their only major quirk. For example, the Salmon needed a specially built cradle to raise it into launch position. Talk about swimming upstream. It took three years to develop a prototype for the Pogo. The first flight tests were conducted inside an old blimp hangar with a tether attached to the nose for safety. Then it was time to move the Pogo outdoors, minus the lifeline for the pilot. A marine aviator named Skeets Coleman was the first and one of the last to actually fly one. The pilot had to climb a ladder to reach the Pogo's cockpit more than 20 feet off the ground. His reclining seat back would be in almost horizontal position, like an astronaut's. The most frightening thing about flying the Pogo uh, was the uh, terrible position in which the pilot was located. Johnny Nabel was one of the only other pilots besides Skeets Coleman to attempt to fly the Pogo. When it came my turn to fly, I was foolish enough to think that I could jump in it and fly it, and I almost wrecked the aircraft doing it. A new aircraft, a radical new concept, so who needs training? The Pogo idea proved that the test pilots of the 1950s were fearless. The XFV-1 was piloted by Herman Fish Salmon. The plane was actually nicknamed after him, but someone must have figured Fish wasn't a cool name for a plane, so they nicknamed it the Salmon instead. Okay. Both aircraft were powered by two counter-rotating propellers on the nose. The Allison YT-40 turboprop engine would provide enough shear power to give the aircraft lift without the benefit of wings. Once airborne, the aircraft would slowly nose down until it flew horizontally like a conventional airplane. Then, the pilot would simply transition back to vertical mode for landing. Sound easy? It was probably not too bad to take off. You know, I could take it off. You could take it off. Getting it back on the ground is another story. The problem was the pilot had to land the plane on its tail backwards while looking over his shoulder. Only sissies would use rear view mirrors. So you had to keep your head inside the cockpit, try to twist your head around in this manner, 
And if you'd like to get a feel for what it was like, uh, try parking a, an automobile in parallel parking sometime by going this way instead of leaning over and, and uh, looking at the curb. But while the Pogo was at least enjoying limited success, the Salmon was floundering. In two years of testing, it was never able to take off or land vertically. And if the Pogo and Salmon were having so much trouble with vertical landings on good old stable terra firma, how were they ever supposed to land at sea? Imagine now doing this, approaching a ship's deck that's pitching in violent seas and trying not to flip the thing over as you contact the surface. Virtually impossible. During the final stages of the Salmon program, a Lockheed engineer actually admitted that test pilots were afraid to fly it. Test pilots afraid? No one was actually killed flying these aircraft, but by the mid-1950s, the Navy decided the Pogo and Salmon had the wrong stuff, and both programs were scrubbed. The Salmon fishtailing its way to total failure at number nine, and the Pogo coming in at number eight because it actually did take off and land vertically. Say it's the late 1960s. You look up and this is what you see. An airplane with mutant wings flying like a helicopter. No, you're not hallucinating this time. You're looking at the CL-84 Dynavert. An airplane that was so unbelievable, it really should have succeeded. The CL-84 came along in the, at the end of the 1950s and into the 60s and 70s. And it was part of a, a long search for an airplane that would take off like a helicopter, cruise at airplane speeds, and land as a helicopter on a fairly confined space. It's got to be 33 years since I've seen this. Here's my name on here. Still there after all these years. Doug Atkins was the chief test pilot for the CL-84 program in Canada. Yeah, this has to be one of the hottest airplanes I've ever flown with all that glass on top. And that was because it had a frangible top and you had to, if you were going to eject, you ejected through that frangible glass. Built by Canadair, the Dynavert could fly horizontally like a normal airplane. But its wings could tilt, allowing the Dynavert to take off and land vertically like a helicopter. The whole wing moving up and down was moved by that screw jack. And that was a very, very uh, primary piece of the equipment. The Dynavert could also hover, fly sideways, and even backwards. With this airplane, it had both very high speed and it was superbly maneuverable. Of course, you get into this uh, mode where you're going to do a, a, a 360 degree turn where you, you just wind the, the tilt up, wing tilt up, and you're driving your lift vector into the center of the turn and you can literally do a 360 degree turn in a 200 foot diameter. The Dynavert was much faster than a helicopter, with flight speeds up to 330 miles per hour and a range of up to 2,400 miles. To take off vertically, the pilot simply pushed a thumb wheel on the joystick and the wings would rotate to a 90 degree angle, putting the propellers in a horizontal position like a helicopter's. Sometimes the tilt wings had a mind of their own. Engineering had assured me, absolutely assured me that this thing would never move uncommanded. And I'm flying along north of Montreal one day and all of a sudden, I'm going slower and up, and here's the wing going up. I, <laughs> I looked at my thumb, it was not on the wing tilt mechanism, and that thing had run away. <laughs> In addition to its vertical takeoff and landing abilities, the CL-84 had short takeoff and landing, or STOL, capability, meaning it could operate with less than 150 feet of runway. For stole operations, the pilot would tilt the wings at a 30 or 40 degree angle, and the Dynavert would touch down or take off in the blink of an eye. The military would have been crazy not to want this aircraft, or so you'd think. It could be used for troop transport, reconnaissance, supply drops, and as a gunship. The U.S. Navy was interested in the Dynavert for search and rescue and anti-submarine warfare. We took it from the Pentagon demonstration down to Oceana in Virginia and uh, did uh, a number of flights uh, out of Oceana and then uh, three flights out onto the Guam 
which is a 15,000 ton uh, helicopter carrier. But it wasn't all smooth flying for the Dynavert. Mechanical failure caused two crashes. No one was injured, but the planes were totaled. While engineers ironed out the kinks, Canadair looked for customers. The timing couldn't have been worse. The Vietnam War was coming to an end, and during the war, helicopters had proven themselves as the vertical takeoff and landing workhorses. So, let's see. Helicopters, in. Weird planes with propellers and tilting wings, definitely out. I flew it every chance I got. <laughs> I was sorry they canceled it. I would have been flying it yet. In fact, with my name on it, they could give it back to me. <laughs> so, was the Dynavert a crazy, impractical idea? Or maybe just a little ahead of its time? After all, a mere one generation later, there's the V-22 Osprey, an airplane that combines vertical takeoff and landing and short takeoff and landing capabilities. Sounds familiar, eh? We can go to the same landing zones the helicopters can go, but we can fly higher and fly faster than they can. So what changed? Instead of tilt wings like the Dynavert, the Osprey has tilt rotors. You can see the nacelles up here, and within that are our engines and our gearboxes. And uh, what those do is they actually move all the way back to 96 degrees, and they can come forward to zero degrees. And like the Dynavert, it's taken the manufacturer a couple of decades to iron out the kinks. It's a very advanced cockpit. We actually have three flight control computers that allow us to be able to phase in and phase out either helicopter or airplane controls as we uh, change from airplane to helicopter modes. With cutting edge controls, the Osprey was able to lick some of the problems the Dynavert couldn't. So where to rank the tilt wing plane that could, but didn't, yet paved the way for the Osprey? For giving it the old Canadian try, the CL-84 Dynavert comes in at number seven. One look at the McDonnell Douglas XF-85 fighter, the Goblin, might have you wondering what were they smoking when they thought this one up? It was nicknamed the Flying Egg. It looks like somebody took an egg and stuck some wings on it. And you can see that it's extremely small from the tail all the way up to the nose, uh, not very big at all. The Goblin is another crazy aircraft designed in the 1950s and proves the axiom of aviation that if an airplane looks good, it'll fly good. And the Goblin is not a good looking airplane. Believe it or not, there actually is a rational explanation for this tiny jet fighter with the stubby little wings. After World War II, the Air Force thought bombers should have their very own personal escort fighters. And what better way to make sure one is there when you need it than to carry it along with you? Latching onto the bomber like a mosquito on steroids, the Goblin earned the designation Parasite Fighter. So the idea was for this parasite fighter to be carried inside a bomber like a B-36 and then be released to fight off the hordes of the enemy fighters and then be recaptured into the airplane and flown along. Well, it just isn't going to work. The Goblin was designed to be carried in the bomb bay of the B-36 Peacemaker. That would be a tight squeeze for a fighter jet. The Goblin was going to have to be mighty small to fit. Really small. At 14 feet from nose to tail, the entire aircraft was shorter than the wingspan of some jet fighters. A conventional tail and elevator wouldn't have fit into the bomb bay of the mothership. So its designers gave the Goblin six smaller tails for stability. And the plane was so compact, the pilot couldn't be any taller than five foot eight. So we have a jet nicknamed the Flying Egg with six tails flown by a miniature pilot. But that's not the best part. The Goblin was attached to a retractable trapeze on the B-36, which latched onto a hook mounted just in front of the Goblin's cockpit. Detaching from the trapeze when it was time to launch the Goblin, piece of cake. After it was launched uh, and while it was in flight, the hook would actually retract into the nose of the airplane. But hooking back onto this flying trapeze while flying was a nightmare. Due to the turbulence of the mothership, uh, the, the Goblin wasn't able to hook up very easily to the mothership. 
In one incident, the goblin collided with the trapeze, smashing the canopy and forcing the pilot to make an emergency landing after plunging 40,000 feet. And since the goblin wasn't intended to ever actually land, they never bothered to fit her with landing gear. Oops, make that a belly landing. The pilot survived and so did the aircraft. But the goblin had succeeded in spooking the Air Force. It was the little fighter jet that couldn't. It was no match for Soviet MiG-15s. It was no match for anything. The project wasted about a billion in today's dollars before the government pulled the plug. The flying egg was more scrambled than well done. And flying it was no yoke. In our countdown of unbelievable flying objects, the goblin ends up at number six. In the 1950s, it seems like everyone was obsessed with UFOs. People turning south from the freeway were startled when they saw three flying saucers high over Hollywood Boulevard. At the same time, the armed services were willing to test almost any idea that seemed promising. So it was only a matter of time before someone tried to invent a real-life flying saucer. In the early 50s, the Canadians had begun experimenting with a proof-of-concept aircraft that captured the imagination of the U.S. Armed Services, called the Avrocar. Early studies on behalf of the United States Air Force proved the feasibility of a circular planform vertical takeoff aircraft utilizing a system of peripheral jets for propulsion, stabilization, and control. The Avrocar looks like George Jetson's car that he drove to work. The way they came up with this idea is either they were drunk or somebody had seen a science fiction movie and they thought, you know, if we've got flying saucers in these things and then go intergalactic, we can build a flying saucer that'll go Mach 1 or Mach 2 for the ground. The US Air Force was interested in the Avrocar as a kind of early stealth aircraft that could hover beneath enemy radar, then zoom into the sky at supersonic speeds. That's right, supersonic. An all-terrain, all-American, built secretly in Canada, reconnaissance vehicle that would be invisible to radar and fly supersonically. And best of all, an homage to a Frisbee. Like a Frisbee, it features a curved upper surface in which air traveling over the top functions just as it does on the wing of a fixed-wing airplane. But how is this flying saucer supposed to actually fly? The Avrocar was powered by three gas turbine engines. The exhaust from these engines drove a turbo rotor in the center of the vehicle. The thrust from the turbo rotor passed through a combination of nozzles on the bottom and side of the Avrocar to create lift and control the aircraft's movements. The pilot, when he moves his control stick, moved this ring one way or the other to allow more air either out of the aircraft to the front, to back, to the sides, and this provided its directional control. In theory, the Avrocar should have worked great, but in reality, it performed pretty dismally. Its unusual propulsion system left the Avrocar underpowered and seriously unstable and the flying saucer rocked and rolled its way through early flight testing. When you reach a speed of about 30 miles an hour, the Avrocar would begin to oscillate wildly around its vertical axis. There were more tests and more modifications. The nozzles were repositioned again and again. Eventually, it began to sink in. The Avrocar was never going to fly very fast or very high without wobbling. In fact, the fastest the Avrocar ever flew was 35 miles per hour. That's Mach 0 0.04. The only way this thing is going to go Mach 2 is if you're hovering at it and you come over a cliff, and in that split second before it hits the ground, it, it might go Mach 2. <laughs> okay, it was a little slow. And the highest it ever got off the ground was about three feet. But it looked cool. The Avrocar was not only weird, it was a failure in every sense of the word. At the end of 1961, and $10 million later, 
the Air Force squashed the Avocar program for good. Colonel Edwards gave the signal to fire. The search for UFOs and flying saucers would go on, but the official attempt to build one was officially dead. The verdict was, let the aliens build flying saucers. It was time for us to try something else. The Avocar's ranking in our pantheon of perfectly strange aircraft, it's a solid number five. There's nothing unbelievable about the Avro Aero supersonic fighter. It's only what happened to the Aero that's hard to believe. The first thing you see when you see the Aero is it's, it's just a gorgeous airplane. It is a beautiful airplane. Uh, unfortunately, it's a beautiful airplane that came along probably at the wrong time. And there she is. Lauren Ursel was a test pilot in the aero program in the 1950s. He hasn't seen the aircraft for nearly 50 years. It's magnificent. It's just magnificent. It, it almost makes me think it's the real thing. This is an aero replica at the Toronto Aerospace Museum. All of the original arrows are gone, but more on that later. I'll open up the clamshell doors for you and you can have a look inside. The Aero was a remarkable aircraft for its time. In fact, this sleek supersonic interceptor was actually ahead of its time. In flight, the Aero was beautiful. It was an elegant thing to see. The, you cannot appreciate the, the elegance of the shape of the aircraft when it's sitting on the ground. In the air, it, it was, I can only describe it as a thing of beauty. Designed by Avro Aviation in the 1950s as a supersonic interceptor, the Aero was fast, fleet, and furious. Its mission was to defend North America from Soviet nuclear bombers. With its advanced electronic system and guided missiles, this supersonic Sentinel is designed to guard the Arctic approaches to the Western Hemisphere. Developed for the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Aero became an intense source of pride for all of Canada, possibly even edging out hockey and maple syrup, at least for a little while. Everybody thought they were doing something significant, and we were. The Aero was one of the most advanced aircraft of its time. One of the first things that's remarkable about this aircraft is its size. This, this aeroplane is 77 feet long and has a wingspan of 50 feet. And it carries a fuel load in the vicinity of 2,700 gallons. The Aero had a swept or delta wing design to facilitate supersonic flight. And the leading edges of the wings were notched to minimize turbulence. The Aero was to be powered by two Orenda Iroquois engines that would deliver three times the thrust of the closest rival, but weighed 30% less. And the aircraft featured a new fly-by-wire design using electrical signals to move flight control surfaces instead of the more conventional hydraulics in use at the time. 10,000 employees swarm to the margins of the field to watch the product of their hands and brains at this climax to the years of creation. Despite a few mishaps, unlike most of the other planes in our countdown, the Aero actually performed even better than expected. On its third flight, the Aero flew supersonically. On its seventh flight, it exceeded 1,000 miles an hour while climbing. It flew faster and higher than any other fighter jet at the time, with speeds approaching Mach 2 and altitudes of nearly 60,000 feet. Well, the Martin Baker seat had a, an elevator. Lauren Ursel was training to fly the Aero in 1957. He had successfully completed a high-speed taxi and was looking forward to his first real flight. When he reported to work the next day, he got a life-altering surprise. My flight had been canceled. That senior management had decided that they did not want to risk checking out another pilot on the aircraft at this time. Ursel didn't know it, but inside Avro headquarters, there were murmurings that the Aero would be terminated. 
Despite its record-breaking potential and shockingly successful debut, a few months later in early 1958, the Canadian government cancelled the program. 29,000 workers and subcontractors were laid off in a single day. Well, the impact uh, of this cancellation on the Canadian uh, aerospace industry was, was extraordinary. It set us back 20 or 30 years. But why kill a revolutionary new aircraft that exceeded expectations? The Canadian press claimed that the Aero's costs were spiraling out of control and that the project was an embarrassment to the new Prime Minister, so it had to be sacrificed. But the real reason may have more to do with priorities south of the border. When the Aero program began, the Americans were worried about Soviet nuclear bombers, but now the concern was Soviet Intercontinental Ballistic Missiles, or ICBMs. The new defense strategy would center around missiles that could kill Soviet ICBMs and not manned interceptor aircraft like the Arrow. But it got caught up in the politics of intercontinental missiles, long-range bombers, and the fact that the technology Many people thought the technology was going to preclude even having a manned fighter at all. And still, the plot thickens. Shortly after the project was cancelled, the Canadian government ordered all six aero research aircraft to be destroyed. No one is certain why. The Aero, a cool plane that was mysteriously killed at birth, and then had almost every trace of its existence erased. But for us, it soars faster than the speed of sound to the number four spot in the countdown of unbelievable flying objects. Surf's definitely up for our next unbelievable flying object. This is the Convair XF2Y Sea Dart, a supersonic fighter jet on water skis. That's my aircraft. I did over 100 tests in the Sea Dart and I loved it. B.J. Long was a Convair Sea Dart test pilot in the 1950s. When we operated the Sea Dart, both the single and twin ski, we would taxi down the seaplane ramp in, into San Diego Bay. The Sea Dart had a V-shaped bottom, like the hull of a motorboat. On takeoff, the hull would lift off of the water and she'd leave the deep blue sea for the wild blue yonder. The U.S. Navy dreamed up the Sea Dart concept as part of a proposed long-range seaplane strike force that wouldn't have to rely on aircraft carriers. The thinking was, with 75% of the Earth's surface being water, that's a lot of runway. Convair Sea Dart is really a cool-looking airplane, but it's just an idea that didn't work. Well, maybe they didn't think this one through totally. After all, putting a supersonic jet on the water on skis could be asking for trouble. And we're just guessing, mind you, that salt water and jet engines might not really mix. You know, the whole idea of a seaplane jet just doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, it's okay to put propellers on a seaplane and put them up way in the air, but on a jet, just by the nature of its design, and on takeoff, it, it gets very rough. The seas, theoretically, could be very rough, and that water is gonna go into the engine. Worse yet, the ocean, as it turned out, was not the friendliest runway. It has these giant speed bumps we call waves. It had to be operated on a very calm sea. So imagine in a combat situation, if there was a calm sea, and the airplane returned and the weather changed and you had three foot waves, you're stuck, you gotta bail out, or you're gonna become a submarine. And what about those stylish skis? Turns out they vibrated so violently on takeoff and landing that the pilot was left shaken and stirred. Most people have been on water skis and you know how rough that is. And I don't know how fast you water ski, but I would have guessed around 20 knots, something like that. Can you imagine taking off at speeds excess of 100 knots on these skis in a jet airplane and possibly rough seas these poor guys are going to lose their fillings before they uh, rotate the plane up out of the water. The vibration would be so bad that I would uh, momentarily go blind from vibration. That's just exactly like having a tuning fork or putting a knife on the edge of a table and twanging it. 
Did he just say he'd go blind? Not good. But the SEDAR program had bigger problems than just the occasional pilot going blind and salt water going into the jet engines. It also had the mother of all laws to overcome, Murphy's Law. In November 1953, test pilot Charles Richborg was demonstrating the sea dart for the Navy brass on San Diego Bay when he attempted a high-speed flyby. It was coming in, going west over San Diego Bay. And when he got into the, over the bay, he fired his afterburner, which caused the nose to pitch down. And then he was, was going to correct. Well, the, the, in those days, they had a, a delay in the system, the way the mechanism was, and he got into a pilot-induced uh, pitch oscillation and the airplane broke up in negative bending. And he was killed in the impact. It was not the kind of publicity that a troubled plane needed. The SEDAR program was suspended, and a few months later, it was canceled. The whole concept behind the SEDAR to take off and land off the water became surpassed by the advent of very large aircraft carriers with steam catapults and the ability to recover very heavy aircraft in very short distances. And the idea of a supersonic seaplane on water skis was sunk for good. All of which makes the sea dart an unbelievable number three. And now, from an interesting idea that might have worked, to an idea that was so bad, it puts the horror in horrible. The Japanese Kugisho Oka was a guided missile with the most intelligent guidance system devised to that time. Near the end of World War II, Allied sea and air power were pounding the Japanese war machine. One of the only advantages the Japanese had were its kamikazes, pilots willing to fly suicide missions for the war effort. But before a kamikaze pilot could sink an Allied ship, he had to run a gauntlet of anti-aircraft fire and protective fighter planes. The Japanese wanted a new kind of aircraft, one specifically built for kamikaze missions, something lighter, faster, and most of all, cheaper. Like most of our other unbelievable flying objects, the Oka was a first. It was the first aircraft specifically designed to kill its pilot. They had a great sense of national honor. There was no shortage of people willing to die for the cause, and they took full advantage of that. With a one-way ticket on a flying bomb, the doomed pilot didn't need much training, but they did practice on a special Oka trainer. Pilots got two or three landing opportunities in this airplane, and they flew at pretty high speeds and landed at an amazing speed of 130 miles an hour. The landing skid down here can show you that. The Oka would be launched from its mothership, a Japanese Betty bomber. The Oka could have been devastatingly effective had it worked the way it was really supposed to. Each Betty bomber could carry one Oka into combat. The problem for the Japanese was the Oka had very limited range, so it had to be dropped close to the targeted warship. Making matters worse, the Betty motherships were so lightly armored and so flammable, they could have put a bullseye on the fuselage. The main problem with the Oko was not the plane itself, it was the fact of getting it to the target. The bombers were too slow and too easily intercepted. It didn't take the U.S. Navy very long to figure out what to do. Well, why wait for the kamikazes to be dropped? Why not go out and destroy the Betty bomber? And that's exactly what we did. We went out and destroyed the bombers carrying in the Okas, and uh, that put a pretty quick end to the, to the threat. In March of 1945, U.S. Navy warplanes shot down 16 Betty motherships before any of the Okas could even be launched. And no doubt, much to the relief of its human guidance systems, by the time the Japanese had redesigned the Oka to boost its power and range, the war was all but over. So while the world's first human-guided missile might be a footnote in history, it is, without a doubt, our number two unbelievable flying object. So, let's see. We've had a flying platform that was more like a flying lawnmower, a flying saucer that never got more than three feet off the ground, a pogo, a salmon, 
A flying egg, or goblin, an airplane with mutant wings that could fly like a helicopter, a supersonic interceptor that disappeared forever, a supersonic fighter on water skis, and the world's first aircraft actually intended to kill its pilot. What could be more unbelievable than that? But our final aircraft was the craziest of them all. It was yet another ludicrous last-ditch effort toward the end of World War II, this time by those ever-so-inventive Nazis. Allied B-17s and B-24s had been pummeling German targets, and the Germans hadn't found an effective way to stop them. Out of sheer desperation, and maybe delusion, the Nazis developed a rocket-powered interceptor called the Viper, also known as the BA-349 Natter. The Natter's mission was to intercept Allied B-17s and blow them out of the sky. That was the theory, anyway. It would have looked kind of like this, except this one was an unmanned target plane in a guided missile test. It's not the kind of airplane that you would build if you're winning the war. It's kind of the last gasp of a desperate people in the last battles of the war. Desperate indeed. The Natter was one of the few World War II aircraft made of wood. These German aviation workers are actually sanding and planing a warplane. They needed something that could be brought into service quickly, produced cheaply using wood rather than, than aluminum, which they were running short of. So the concept of a rocket-propelled point defense interceptor uh, had a certain appeal. One of the only remaining Natters in the world is located at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's restoration facility outside of Washington, D.C. The Natter was among the most bizarre advanced German weapon systems of World War II. Powered by its rocket motors, the Natter would blast off vertically from a launch tower on the ground. The towers would be set up around whichever target the Natter squadron would be defending. The rocket motors would propel the airplane up to the altitude of the bombers in under a minute, up to 20 or 25,000 feet. The lucky pilot of this wooden interceptor would use rudimentary controls to guide it toward the Allied bomber. The Natter was armed with 24 70-millimeter rockets, neatly packed in its nose cone. A protective nose cap covered the rocket armament in the nose of the airplane. As the pilot initiated his attack on a bomber, first the nose cap was jettisoned, and then all 24 rockets were fired off scattergun fashion in a salvo. The Natter was literally a one-shot deal. And there was no landing gear because, like the Goblin, the Natter wasn't designed to do anything as simple as just land. No, that would be way too easy. Instead of gliding back to Earth, the pilot would pull a lever, activating explosive bolts, which allowed the entire forward section of the aircraft, the nose, the windscreen, to detach and fall away. After the nose section was jettisoned, the pilot, who had already unbuckled his seat harness, pulled another lever, which allowed a second parachute to deploy from the rear of the airplane. The pilot then was thrown forward away from the aircraft and came down by his own parachute. The rear section of the Natter then floated to Earth, where it could be refueled, refitted, and flown again. Let us review. Pilot flies wooden plane launched like missile up to Allied bomber, shoots 24 missiles at once out of the nose, and as he flies back toward Earth, he pops away the front of the wooden plane, has a parachute pull away the back of the reusable wooden plane, leaving him now wooden planeless while simultaneously popping another chute for himself. But the Natter program never really got off the ground. With an imminent Allied invasion, there wasn't much time for testing, let alone deployment. This guy definitely wouldn't be smiling if he actually had to fly this thing. The odds of returning safely from a mission were not going to be sehr gut. No surprise that at least one pilot was killed during testing when he lost control after launch. The Natter is really a, an illustration of not only the desperation of the Nazi regime, but its attitude towards its fighter pilots by late 1944. The airplane was intended to be a semi-expendable interceptor, in a sense, so too were the pilots. And in the end, the Natter never even came close to downing a single Allied bomber. 
On the eve of the Allied victory, the Germans blew up 10 of the remaining natters. We're guessing to spare themselves from the embarrassment. So let's see, inept, inert, and inhumane. In our countdown of unbelievable flying objects, the nutty Nazi natter is hands down our number one unbelievable flying object. So there you have it. From the pitiful to the impractical, from the sublime to the ridiculous, most of these aircraft were the wrong planes, in the wrong places, at the wrong times. Engineers and designers dared to dream, when in hindsight, they probably should have stayed awake. The Oka, the Natter, the Dynavert, the Sea Dart, and the Pogo. Some were wacky, some were wild, and some were built out of sheer desperation. But while most of these aircraft flopped, many of them bravely blazed a trail for aviation breakthroughs in years to come. I'm not sure we would have gotten there if it hadn't been for some of the funny things we did. And uh, God bless them all for trying. As long as there is aviation, there will be engineers, aviators, and just plain dreamers who can't resist pushing that envelope unafraid of inventing something unbelievable enough to qualify as an unbelievable flying object that just might work.